A couple months ago, we released a video over 8 great JRPGs with deep and mature stories. In that video, we hinted at a potential part 2 if the interest was there, and considering it got way more views than usual on top of a lot of comments showing interest for it, I think it's safe to say the people have spoken. With that said, this is a pretty broad topic and there still are some entries that could have been fitting but didn't quite make the cut here, so if there is interest in another part after this, you know what to do in the comment section. Anyway, I'm gonna keep this intro pretty short as I already went through the criteria in the first video, but just to quickly go over it, we're not really looking for stories about 14 year olds saving the world here. Not to say stories like those can't be deep, but as fans who grew up with the genre and are now older, it's just nice to play as someone, well, a little older. Like for example, the Persona games do have some really mature themes, but I don't always want to play as a high schooler, you know? So yeah, not only is this video gonna focus on JRPGs with deep and mature themes, but it's also gonna try to focus on some titles in the genre that have a somewhat older cast for us non-teenagers to relate to. Last thing, like all of our other 8 great format type videos, these will not be ranked in any particular order. So, without further ado, here's a list of 8 great JRPGs with deep and mature stories. Part 2. Alright, to start off this list, we have Valkyrie Profile. I really wanted to include this one in our first video, but we already had enough PS1 games and I just talked about it in our video about Enix in the 90s, so yeah. Decided to wait on it for this one. Valkyrie Profile was developed by Triace, published by Enix, and easily has one of the most dark and depressing stories on the entire PS1. The game doesn't try to hide it either. In the opening cutscene, you see talk about a 14-year-old girl being sold into slavery before she dies in a field of poisonous flowers shortly after. <laughs> yeah, this game doesn't waste any time pulling no punches. In the main story, you play as Lenneth, a Valkyrie tasked by the god Odin to recruit fallen soldiers for the upcoming Battle of Ragnarok. In order to recruit these fallen soldiers, you have to witness the events leading up to their, well, fall first, and yeah, needless to say, it can be pretty damn sad. Definitely a lot of depressing deaths in this game, but they're all handled very well. The combination of the excellent writing and emotional music pulling out your heartstrings just really immerses you into the moment. The overarching plot is pretty engaging too, but these individual character scenarios are where the true narrative greatness lies. Story and characters aside, the gameplay is incredibly fun too. There's a lot of platforming and dungeons to keep things exciting and the battles themselves, they're quite unique. To my side, my noble Einherjar. Each party member's attack is mapped to a different button which allows you to create and chain combos together. It's quite a bit more complex than that, but this video is not about battle systems, so I won't get into it too much. I probably should have at least included it as an honorable mention in our video by the top 10 turn-based battle systems last month, so I'm sorry VP fans, I let you guys down. There was also a sequel to Valkyrie Profile on the PS2 along with a spin-off on the DS, but I'ma be honest, I haven't played those so I can't really comment on them. The reception around Valkyrie Profile 2 seems great though, whereas the spin-off's reception seems a little more mixed. In addition to this, there's also a third mainline installment called Valkyrie Elysium coming out later this year, so yeah, the franchise lives on. To top it all off, they're also going to be releasing an enhanced remake of the original PS1 version, Valkyrie Profile Lineth, initially released for the PSP, to come out on the PS4 and PS5. Needless to say, this is fantastic news, so there's about to be no better time to get into this dark and mature tale about Norse mythology. Check it out. It might not go so well next time. Coming up next, we have both Ogre Battle, March of the Black Queen, and Ogre Battle 64, Person of Lordly Caliber. Yeah, I'm including both here to spread the love and because they're really similar. I'm sorry Tactics Ogre fans, I'm saving you for another day. Plus, you will be satisfied with another Tactics game later in this video, so hint hint. March of the Black Queen was released for the Super Nintendo, whereas Person of Lordly Caliber was released for the Nintendo 64. You play as Destin in March of the Black Queen, whereas in Ogre Battle 64, you assume the role of Magnus, two soldiers caught up in the midst of a revolution. Their in-game universes are actually connected, however, you don't need to play the first one in order to understand Ogre Battle 64. The main character Destin from the first game can join you in Ogre Battle 64 though, which I always thought was really cool. 
They're both deeply engrossing tales about revolutions and the moralities of war. Seriously, the writing in these games are absolutely top notch. Especially Ogre Battle 64. That story hooked me in like no other. I mean, come on, it's one of the rare RPGs to do a time skip, complete with different character portraits. I love it when games do this. Regardless of the game, there's multiple ways to advance through the plot. Both games feature an alignment system which is influenced by a variety of factors. This not only determines some of the characters you can recruit, but also how the story is going to play out later in the game, as well as the ending. Of course, this gives the games a good amount of replayability. Gameplay-wise, both games are a really unique combination of real-time strategy and turn-based battles. It's not really the scope of this video, but trust me, it is deep with strategy, complexity, and customization. It may be a little slow moving for some people, but to those that it does appeal to, it's insanely addicting. I remember rinsing the shit out of Ogre Battle 64 back in the day as I couldn't get enough of it. With that said, the gameplay is what drew me in, but it's the story that really kept me. If you're looking for some RPGs with deep gameplay and mature stories about war, betrayal, and the morality of mankind, then look no further than these two gems right here. If nothing else, they're both some of the most unique games I've ever played. The next game we have on our list is Parasite Eve. I'm sure many of you expected this one in our first video, so alas, here we are. This PS1 Squaresoft classic was not only their first mature rated game ever, but it was also the first to take place in a more modern setting I believe. In this game, you play as Aya Brea, a rookie with the New York Police Department over the week of Christmas in 1997, as she tries to stop a supernatural entity by the name of Eve from destroying the world. When it comes to the story, Parasite Eve is actually a sequel to a novel with the same name. Considering it was Squaresoft's first mature title, as you can probably guess, it was quite mature. I mean, the opening cutscene shows you on a blind date at the opera as you then watch everyone spontaneously combust into flames. There's also rats mutating into hideous monsters and shit and yeah, it can be pretty creepy. A lot of the CGI square used in games around these times were more to show off the grand scope and beauty of the world, whereas Parasite Eve on the other hand used them in more unsettling ways. Parasite Eve is very much a horror game, both in tone and in imagery. A lot of people describe it as if Final Fantasy met Resident Evil and honestly, yeah, that's a pretty accurate statement. Between the gorgeous pre-rendered backgrounds and the ominous chilling music, the atmosphere here is just exquisite. The only bad thing is that there's not enough of it as the game is only about 10 hours long. Well, in an era with bloated 100 hour adventures, maybe this actually isn't a bad thing on second thought. It's a very tight knit experience with excellent pacing that doesn't drag on. As I get older and my free time gets a bit more scarce, I would say quality over quantity any day. When you combine the captivating and mature story with a hauntingly beautiful OST, pretty visuals, and the extremely fun battle system that's a mix of turn-based and real-time with a surprising amount of depth, and you have an absolutely replayable classic for ages to come. There was a sequel to Parasite Eve, but it's a lot less RPG based and more plays out like a typical Resident Evil game instead. It's not bad, just different. Still worth checking out though. Coming up next, we have Shadow Hearts and its sequel, Shadow Hearts Covenant. These are two titles that I'm sure many of you expected in the first video and yeah, I did hint at them. Instead, I went with Digital Devil Saga as a PS2 duology to get some SMT inclusion, but better late than ever, here we are. Both these games were developed by Sacknoth, later known as Nautilus, and came out for the PS2. They're actually connected to the PS1 horror RPG, Kodelka, and take place after that game's bad ending. With that said, Shadow Hearts Covenant is a direct sequel to the first Shadow Hearts game, which is why I'm including both of them here. In both games, you play as the anti-hero, Yuri Hayuga, a Harmonixer with the power to fuse into monsters' souls that he defeats in battle. I gotta say it, Yuri is a hell of an awesome protagonist. In a genre full of goody two-shoes heroes that can do no wrong, it's a nice change of pace to have sort of a rude, sarcastic protagonist that's not afraid to speak his mind. The man's a fan favorite for a reason. That aside, the story is very dark, mature, and deep. The plot of course varies from game to game, but regardless of the title, you're in for an engaging tale with many memorable moments and twists along the way. The setting of these games combines an alternate history version of early 1900s with a sort of a cosmic Lovecraftian whore type vibe. The bunch of real life locations are used too. It's a really cool and unique atmosphere. 
Gameplay-wise, Shadow Hearts uses a turn-based battle system, however, it has something called a Judgment Ring that sets it apart. It adds a timing element to battles and keeps you actively participating. I love this. All in all, with the dark and mature stories, great characters, and the addicting battle system, Shadow Hearts 1 and 2 are some of the PS2's finest RPGs. There was a third game in the Shadow Hearts series, Shadow Hearts from the New World, however it features a different protagonist and different story. It's not quite as good either, and the vibe is completely different. Still, if you love the first two enough, it might be worth checking out. The next game we have on our list is Final Fantasy Tactics. This entry should come as no surprise as I straight up mentioned it in our first video, but went with Final Fantasy VI instead to get some SNES representation. In my opinion though, this game has one of the best and mature stories in the entire Final Fantasy series. Hell, a lot of people call it the best story in the series. It's more like top 3 for me, but that's more due to my preference and setting. Writing wise, I do think it's the best the series has to offer. With that said, there are different scripts for Final Fantasy Tactics, which does vary based on the version you play. There's the original PS1 version, and the PSP enhanced port, War of the Lions. In addition to some extra content, like the inclusion of cutscenes and an extra playable class, the PSP version also contains a much more medieval and Shakespearean sounding script. The writing in both versions is excellent regardless, so it's just gonna come down to preference. When it comes to the actual story, in this game you play as Ramza, a squire from the prestigious House of Beolv in the Kingdom of Ivalice. I don't really want to get into it too much to avoid spoilers, but throughout your journey you'll witness war, corruption, treason, and many more mature themes. Seriously, the plot, the character relationships, the questions that it raises, it's all just handled so extremely well. It's not only one of the best stories the Final Fantasy series has to offer, but it's one of the best in the genre, period. In discussions online, the story always gets tons of high praise, for good reason. It really is top tier. What's also top tier is the OST and the gameplay. There's a lot of really relaxing tracks on screens you spend a lot of time on and it makes the experience that much better. Gameplay wise, as the name implies, it plays out like your standard grid based tactics game and still remains one of the most fun systems the genre has seen. If for some reason you've yet to play this PS1 Squaresoft classic, what are you waiting for? Check this one out. Coming up next, we have Octopath Traveler. Octopath Traveler was co-developed by Square Enix and Acquire and came out for the Nintendo Switch. Let me just start this off by saying I know a lot of people were disappointed in Octopath Traveler's story due to there being no connection between the individual character scenarios. However, while there may not be any super epic overarching plot, some of those individual character scenarios are really mature and really good. In Octopath Traveler, you play as eight different, well, travelers, all with their own unique story to tell, divided into four chapters. Each character's story has their own themes and they vary quite a bit. I'm not gonna act like every single one was top tier as there were a couple that were a little less interesting to me, but for the most part they are quite engaging with some real standouts. My favorites were probably Alphins, Ulbrix, and Primroses. Primrose's story is particularly dark and deals with heavy themes such as sex slavery, human trafficking, and prostitution. I remember being shook when I got to her part and being like, oh shit, this is in a Nintendo game? Yeah, pretty heavy stuff. Ulbrich's story starts off pretty generic, but takes some interesting turns later on with some really strong writing. He's a 35-year-old warrior trying to find his purpose in life and comes to find out that intentions and actions aren't always so black and white. His story is sure to resonate with a lot of older gamers. Alfin's story is perhaps my favorite in the entire game. He's a traveling apothecary trying to do good in the world and god I just love the issues his story tackles. There's big themes of morality and if someone should be saved, even if they're a bad person. It's super interesting and handled extremely well. What also helps some story moments hit harder in addition to the great writing and mature themes are the excellent voice acting and music. If you know what's best for you'll free them at once. The voice acting all around is just top notch and really sells some scenes. And the music, oh man, the music, so good. Honestly, it might just have my favorite OST this generation out of any RPG right next to Persona 5 and Nier Automata. It really is that amazing. Combine this with a really deep and strategic battle system and class system, and you have an absolute must play with Octopath Traveler. 
My only gripe with the game is that the characters don't really interact with each other outside of some small moments, and like I mentioned earlier, there really is no overarching plot. This is a common criticism with the game, and hopefully something they fix in the sequel. Still an amazing title with some deep and mature themes though, and well worth playing. Time to see just how far my talents will go. The next game we have on our list is The Last Story. The Last Story was developed by Mistwalker and came out for the Nintendo Wii. Yup, the same team behind Lost Odyssey from our first video about the subject. For those that don't know, as a quick reminder, the company Mistwalker was founded by Hironobu Sakaguchi, the legendary creator of the Final Fantasy series. What makes The Last Story different from other Mistwalker titles though is that it was the first one to actually be directed by Sakaguchi himself. Combine this with Final Fantasy series composer Nobuo Oimatsu behind the OST, and you have quite the epic team behind the last story. Bowman, here's with the best you've got. In this game, you play as Zael, a member of a band of mercenaries who dreams of becoming a knight. The story, of course, branches out from there, though, and gets a lot deeper. It's very much a character-driven narrative and sort of like a combination between a coming-of-age tale and a love story. The writing is great, the voice acting is excellent, and overall the game just does a fantastic job of getting you absorbed into the plot. In addition to those, I'm a big fan of the characters in this game. For the most part, the characters are all a little older, like in their 20s and 30s, and you see them drinking together and having great banter with each other, and yeah, it's just handled well. Shut it! I risked my life out there. Let me drink in peace. Sir, may I ask who our next client is? We really need more RPGs with older casts instead of them treating the 25-year-old member of the group as the grisly old veteran who's seen it all. Gameplay-wise, The Last Story plays out like an action RPG with a lot of environmental factors coming into play. You only physically control Zale, though, as the other party members are handled by the AI. Sakaguchi created this gameplay in response to the criticism of Lost Odyssey and Blue Dragon being a little too traditional. Well, in my opinion, I do think that traditional turn-based combat did age better, but the combat here is still pretty fun. Overall, The Last Story is an extremely overlooked title with a very engaging narrative. If you still have your Wii buried somewhere collecting dust, I'd say this game is a quality reason to bust it out again. And to finish off this list, we have Front Mission. Front Mission was developed by then Squaresoft, now Square Enix, and came out for the Super Famicom originally. However, that version only made it to Japan. It wouldn't see an official English release until the DS version many years later. With that said, the Super Famicom version does have a fan translation online though, so both versions are still plenty playable. The Super Famicom version is said to have a slightly darker and more mature script, whereas the official DS translation toned those themes down a bit. The DS version does have an extra playable scenario though with that said, so it's just gonna come down to preference. Regardless of the version you decide to play, you're in for an incredibly fun tactical RPG with a super deep and mature story set in more modern times. The story has you playing as Lloyd Clyde, the captain of an OCU platoon of Wanzers, which are basically just giant mechs that humans control. Overall, it's a deep story featuring themes of war, revenge, politics, nationalism versus globalism, and yeah, just more mature stuff in general. It's a very captivating plot with a lot of depth and great writing that really makes you think. With that said, the world building of Front Mission, and really just the series as a whole, is probably the best part. This first Front Mission game serves as the beginning of a five part series all with interconnected stories. So if you really like the story here, it's highly recommended that you check out the other titles in the series. What you'll find is one of the deepest plots to unfold in the entire Square Enix library. But yeah, as a standalone title, Front Mission still holds up very well with a solid story, fun and complex gameplay, and awesome music. If you're looking to dive into this deep mecha series, then by all means, absolutely check this one out first. Alright, and that about wraps up this video. Thanks for watching everyone, we hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please either consider hitting that like button, or subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. Like I mentioned in the intro, there still are a lot of other RPGs that could be fitting for this topic, so if there is interest for a part 3 at some points, let us know in the comments below. 
And as always, just want to give a huge thank you to our Patreon supporters. And an extra special shout out to our top patrons, Aaron Melcher, Jesse Spencer, and Jump Rock. All of your guys' support and generosity is very much appreciated. Other than that, thanks again for watching everyone and hope you have an awesome day. This is Corbin from Gaming Productions. Until next time.